rig the elections. They may try, but it takes quite a lot of logistical capacity to adequately rig the elections. And you have to be able to rely on sufficient numbers of people mm -hmm. to do it. And so they may try, but it may not be as successful. But it tends to be in those middle-ranking countries, the countries that are often referred to as electoral authoritarian states, where you have um, those competition. So th the opposition does have an opportunity to compete you know, and have some hope of doing well. Uh, but in order to, to, to win it, make sure they're winning the election, the, the authoritarian neighbors need to make sure that they have a good system of vote rigging and electoral manipulation in place to, to make sure that they come home every time uh, and are in power. And so it tends to be in those middle ranking countries. In economic and social terms, it tends to be in, in states that have um, there's that, not too much of an economic link, but it tends to be in states that have high levels of corruption, generally, high levels of inequality and a lack of media freedom. Those are the three factors that I've found in my own research to be most closely linked. And media freedom is, is the big one. It's, the, it's the, the single variable that predicts electoral uh, malpractice the best is, is lack of media freedom. Um, I think the last question is Paul. Uh, Paul, you have a presentation. And second, I was really, I thought it was very interesting that you, within the two compromises at the center of the uh, deal really, both for the opposition and for the uh, parties in power. But there, it looks like there's an institutional mechanism that has to be available for, for groups to be willing to participate, which is a system that is not based on winner takes all. So I was wondering if there are already any findings on the matter, whether presidential regimes are more uh, inclined to do these kinds of malpractices compared to parliamentary regimes, because there is the possibility that the winner takes more of the system, that it's all or nothing type of system, and whether more majoritarian uh, electoral systems are less like, uh, more likely to, again, uh, to be these kinds of results compared to more proportional systems. If this has been studied, well, that's one thing. If it's not, it looks like it's a good direction to go and see if there's a correlation between that which further strengthen uh, your findings. Yeah, yeah, there has been study actually. Oh. I mean, there's, there are different findings when it comes to, um, well, you have to look at presidential elections versus elections to parliaments and assemblies. Mm -hmm. But um, people have found different things. Some people have found no strong relationship. But I think there's more scholars who have found that the presidential elections tend to be um, more manipulated, precisely for the reasons you identify. So they're winner take all. So the stakes are very high. The high stakes are have more of an incentive to engage in electoral manipulation. And um, I think partly for the same reason, the majority, there are several studies, quite a number of studies, that have found that majority of electoral systems are associated with high levels of manipulation. I think there are two reasons for that. Firstly, that just the, the stakes are higher within each constituency. That either you win or you lose. It's not like your party might get some seats as opposed mm -hmm. to other seats. Um, but also, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a greater incentive for individual contestants in, in single member districts to cultivate personal votes and to engage in, in vote buying and so forth. But also, in a majoritarian system, because of the way um, because of the way votes are converted into seats, often it requires only a very small, small number of votes to be shifted to change the outcome. So for example, after there was just recently there was an elected election in the United Kingdom that yielded an unexpected result. One of the, the newspapers after that election calculated that if 701 people had cast their votes differently, in just in, so they identified a certain number of constituencies where the result was really close. If 701 people in those constituencies had, had cast their vote for the Labour Party rather than the Conservative Party, um, the Conservatives would not have got majority. The Labour Party wouldn't have got majority anyway, but it would have been a different election outcome. So, um, to, to sh if you had been, if you had been, uh, you know, an electoral manipulator and you wanted to manipulate that elected, you only would have had to shift 700 votes, mm -hmm. and you would have a different outcome. Whereas in a proportional representation system, you have to shift typically millions of votes to significantly change the outcome. So, with a single member district, it requires a smaller number of votes to be changed to change the outcome, and so there's a greater incentive to do it because the, the, the cost is quite uh, lower to change a smaller number of votes. You just have to focus on this area, this area, this area. Most of the elections can be fine and clean. You just have to engage a little bit of electoral manipulation in different places. So, it's, um, it's, in that sense, it's, it's easier, and there's also a greater incentive for the individual concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that, that is a pretty robust finding. There have been several studies that have found.
Thank you so much for the presentation. Even if you have said that you're not an expert in Turkish politics, the things that you have described actually sound like you have lived in Turkey for the last 10 years. So that's, so that's, that's what we have experienced during the last 10 years. What I, what I wondered was kind of, you know, you, you, you just described situations or conditions for electoral malpractice in a kind of not consolidated democracies. Uh, but also you have mentioned that these kind of activities can be observed in the consolidated democracies like UK and so on. So I'm just wondering about what might be the reasons for the consolidated democracies going into that electoral malpractice. Because we all know that if you do not have a free media or, or the other factors that you have described for the unconsolidated democracies, you can explain the action in a logical way. But for the consolidated democracies, there had to be something more about this. So what's, what's your point of opinion about this? I think in any state, there, there always will be people who will try to engage in electoral malpractice because there's always an incentive if you're really keen to win an election, if it's very important for you, the stakes are high. I mean, the job of a politician is a very unusual job because you have very high prestige and high power, but very poor job tenure. You only have your job for four or five years and you have to apply for it again. And that, you know, it's, it, it's a strange job um, and it attracts slightly unusual people. It tends to attract people that can set, accept high degrees of risk. So a lot of politicians are risk takers. If you're a risk taker, you might, and also it attracts people who, in many contexts at least, have kind of somewhat dubious morals. They're prepared to engage in, in behavior that other people might consider um, uh, not acceptable. Not, not least just, you know, the, the politics is combative. You have to be prepared to go up against other people. You can't, you can't always be polite in politics. So it attracts a certain type of people, the risk takers, people who, you know, some of them who always have dodgy morals. And so you have to have very robust institutions to control, because there's always going to be somebody who's going to try to engage in electoral malpractice. Um, and so sometimes, uh, some states, people take their eye off the ball. Populations and electoral officials, they, 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 they just don't think there's a problem, and they forget. I mean, I, the example of the UK, um, there was a problem with falling turnout. Turnout went below 60% in 2001. And all of a sudden, there was a new electoral commission that had just been formed, and they were basically given a mandate to improve turnout. And so they allowed anyone who wanted to have a postal ballot to apply for a postal ballot before you had to have a special reason to get a postal ballot and vote, vote by mail. They allowed anyone to do that. And not surprisingly, there were, in a small number of areas, there were people who would apply for 20, 30 postal ballots from one address and say, well, the 30 people living here, but there weren't for 30 people living there didn't have to show any identification, you didn't have to give any proof that you lived there, you just had to put your name on a form. You could put, one, the head of the household filled the form, head of the household could put as many names on that form as they wanted, and those people then could go vote, or some could go vote with no name. Uh, and there was no identification required at polling stations. And so it was a very open system, and the, and the British people just thought, well, we don't have any problems with our elections, you know, we've had democratic elections since the 19th century, we don't have election fraud, it's just not an issue here. There's no risk, but they were wrong, because there always will be somebody who will um, try. And now, there's, you know, there, there have been a couple of isolated cases of, of postal vote fraud and other types of electoral fraud, and the confidence in the election has gone way down. It used to be very high levels of popular confidence. Now it's only about 60% um, of people who think the elections are free and fair in the UK, because of these widely reported cases in the media. And so I think it's just when, when populations and um, election officials and politicians and population citizenry, they, they forget that there's a problem. They think, oh, in our country, they get, become a bit arrogant, arrogant Democrats. They think, oh, our country, it's not a problem. This, this, you know, these, these problems happen elsewhere. It's not anything we have to worry about, but they're, they're always wrong. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. As Emma has mentioned a few moments ago, I mean, as we're having a new election coming uh, in Turkey in just about 10 days, it is, uh, and there is a lot of, um, shall we say, suspicion about the outcomes of the election in Turkey. This was very, I should say, telling about many cases that we may experience. I want to ask something else. When you mentioned uh, the international community and you, you sort of shifted the interest to the domestic observers 
rather than international observers. Uh, that's probably the case because the domestic observers, of course, know better the situation. Um, even though in, in the last couple of elections, the domestic observers have also been manipulating uh, fraud in, in, in Turkish elections. I mean, you can always sort of uh, produce in, in a Twitter account a ballot, a picture of a ballot that's not necessarily correct and you circulate it around, and it creates enormous uh, sort of anxiety. And then, then it becomes a problem in itself, because then it's not true, then it becomes a problem because you're going to the election uh, sort of offices and saying, this, well, there is this, and they said, well, it doesn't exist, really. This, this ballot box is a non-existing ballot box, and so on. So, it, it, I mean, it, they themselves can be misinterpreting or abusing this opportunity. So I want to concentrate more on international observers. I mean, OEC, for the, uh, I think it's for the second time, is being asked in Turkey to come and observe the elections. It's <coughs> interesting that we have been part of OEC since its establishment, more or less. But then, it's the sort of second time in I think in two years, I mean, it was the first time last year, and this year they have been asked to come in to observe elections. In what way can they be more effective? Is there any way there can be more, uh, they have more powers over the governments to improve the electoral system? Or can we think of the international global community as a positive actor? rather than an observing actor in, in elections. Uh, there's a big controversy uh, about this in the scholarly community. I think most people who study international election observation would say that quality international election observers, like OSC observers, have a positive role. Um, there are a lot of organizations that send election observers that are not uh, that are quite politicized and that do not do quality election observers, but just basically are, um, you know, give the result that uh, the, the, the verdict that the, the leaders running the election want to hear. Um, and so they are sort of the dictator's friend. But I think the, the OSC is, is one of the very best. The OSC in the EU are probably the, do the best election observation. The OSC improved it, the quality of its election observation quite dramatically in the mid 1990s when they passed, a, they had a complete overhaul of their election observation procedures and they um, now send a lot of long term election observers, that can, people who go in for a couple of months before the election and then short term election observers for, for the period just around election day and they monitor many more aspects of the electoral process. They have a very detailed uh, document <coughs> that shows how you can uh, evaluate election law, it's available online. And, evaluate their own electoral law according to this, this document. And they have very detailed guidelines for monitoring every single aspect of the electoral process and they've developed those together with the Council of Europe, which has been very, the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe has been very active in developing guidelines for what's free and fair election procedures. Um, and so the, the OSC has, has a very, very detailed um, procedure for, for documenting electoral uh, practices. They have um, they have a very, very good methodology now for, uh, for, for for having checklists for observers to complete about where they, and where they send the, the observers, it's sort of their randomization built into it, so it's quite scientific. So OSC election observing observation is very high quality. I think OSC election observation reports carry a lot of weight in the international community. Uh, they have a lot of international prestige, especially among OSC member states. The OSC has started sending observer missions to all OSC member states that recently, just in the last 10 years or so, all OSC member states have committed to having election observers come and observe. So they come and observe UK elections, they go and observe US elections, US member. Although there was one, I spoke to somebody who's probably went to the US uh, election observation the last time they did an election, and the go the, I think the governor of Texas sent them out, forced them out of the states. I won't have any Europeans in my state and wouldn't allow them to observe the elections in Texas. <laughs> and the observer I talked to said that he's been all over the world observing elections. He's a very experienced observer and he had never been treated so badly. He was, he was treated in Texas. 
um, because they just didn't accept international election observation in Texas. Um, but they, yeah, all OSC member states are, are committed to having election observation. Um, that said, there are a lot of things that international election observers can't see and don't see. Um, they, they very often don't know the language, um, they have interpreters, um, they, they, they only go to a limited number of polling stations, they stay for maybe two hours and then they leave. It's even any given polling station, they're only there for a short period of time. Um, they, uh, there are a lot of things that even if the long-term um, uh, missions can't observe, I mean they can't vote by things that happen house to house, things that happen behind the scenes, and they, even if they have a very large mission of 300 people, they, 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 there's, not, there's not, there's a very small number of individuals, or a like, very common type of manipulation of campaign finances, the abuse of state resources, they can, there's no way they're ever going to be able to document that. They can talk to people on the ground and rely on hearsay, but in order to really hold the leadership to account, you have to have people, domestic observers, non-partisan domestic observers, at the polling station from the time, every single polling station, from the time that polling station opens to the time that polling station closes. And that's how you monitor an election. They have to be there at every single polling station all day long. And there's no way international observers can ever do that. Thousands of polling stations in any decent sized country like Turkey that you yeah, requires thousands and thousands of observers in the international community can never afford to send um, that many. So I think that I think international election observation has a role, but it, its role can can in certain circumstances backfire. If there's a negative report, um, domestic leaders can use that negative report as a way of saying, oh, the West doesn't like us, the West is, is critical of us. And they think, they often like Russia's classic cases, they actually kicked out the OSC, wouldn't let them observe in one of their elections, because they said they saw the OSC as being a vehicle of the West. Now, I mean, most OSC member states are not Western, they're mostly Eastern European states, and the vast majority of OSC member states are in Eastern Europe. So it's not a Western organization, but Russia portrayed it as a, you know, a Western influence, interfering in our domestic politics. So international observers always I think there always will be some sense that they're, they're outsiders, they're foreigners coming to evaluate us, and somehow it's interference. And I think there always is that tension um, between, yeah, who, people don't like internationals coming in and judging them. It's much better if it's done also by domestic people. You know, follow that. I mean, exactly the, the last word you said. But on the other hand, I mean, if there is a negative report, the Western countries, and I, here I mean Western European democratic countries, do not take it as seriously as uh, sort of challenging the countries uh, on the country on which the negative report is. So on the one hand, I mean, neither, we're, we're, for example, like a, a country of the European Union, or you've mentioned the uh, Council of Europe, I mean, no, they will not go to Russia and say, well, here we have OECE report that says that your sort of outcomes, your elections are negatively reported, shall we say? So, I mean, so so in a way, I mean, you can say you can. It's irrelevant. It becomes pointless because there is no conditionality, shall I say? Although this is a European term, not necessarily a Council of Europe term, but there is no conditionality behind it. Nothing happens. So you have a negative report. So what? The Western. Although I think that's a problem. And even in, I mean, in Bulgaria and Romania, I've sort of studied this, and the, before Bulgaria and Romania joined the European Union, there was conditionality. Classic case of conditionality. If you improve the quality of your elections, you can join. And they gave them, both Bulgaria and Romania, they gave them a list of things they needed to do to improve their electoral processes. And they said, if you don't, if you do this, you know, it's one of the things that you need to do to join. If you don't do it, you can't join. And so then there was another election, and they still didn't fully improve. They said, no, you, you still got to make some changes. You haven't done it. And in neither case, neither in Bulgaria and Romania, did they make the changes that were required, and they still let them join. So, you know, that's the, the if there's going to be any type of conditionality, it would have been there that Bulgaria and Romania would have made those changes so to be allowed into the EU, but they didn't. So, yeah, I mean, that's why I think there's a problem with international election observation. It can be, 
a negative report can actually be used, I mean, Putin is the classic case of used negative AOC reports to his advantage, because he said, oh, these nasty people in the West, these nasty foreigners coming in and telling us that, you know, that, that we're not doing things right, and then he drums up nationalist support for him because of the, the negative reports. So that's why I think there's a limit to what international observers can do. Or want to do. And also, this, I mean, there are some people who have, have said that international electoral observation negative reports can spark violence. So if you think of, you know, people really don't want to have their, their votes stolen. They really value their vote. They want to contribute to the de democratic process. And it's a really bad thing for democracy. It's a bad thing normatively if people's votes are stolen. But it's a much worse thing if they're killed. So, you know, it's a very difficult situation that international observers are often in. If it's a country with a history of post-electoral violence, then if they issue a very negative report, there's going to be a riot the next day and people are going to die. And so often they don't quite say what they want to say. Or they do, and, and there is a riot, and people die. So. Yeah, that's why it's, um, it, yeah, I think that there are limits to international election observation. That's why I think domestic election observation is the way to go. Although I think it has to be professional. Like you say, I mean, after the, the, the independence referendum that took place in Scotland in September, there was this flurry of um, reports on Twitter that there had been electoral fraud. And they were like, they, people tried to document it with photos. And, and the people who were in charge of running the elections, and even the officials on both, both the yes and the no side of the camp said, no, the, the elections were fine, the, the, the referendum was fine, there were really no problems. But there was this sort of a collective hysteria um, about this that peaked you know, a few days after. And, and, there, and there are still, um, the surveys show that there are much higher and large number of people in Scotland who think that the elections are conducted fraudulently because of this flow of social media activity. So the domestic election observation has to be conducted in a professional way, people have to be trained, they have to go through a formal process, and it really should be only groups that are trusted, non-partisan actors. And so it has to be institutionalized a bit more than it is in many contexts, including the UK. Thank you.